I am very delighted and honored to welcome Professor John Mortensen uh, to the HPI Colloquium this week. Uh, some of you may know him from, from previous trips to Bloomington, or perhaps you might know him from his online uh, work, uh, his online resources. Um, he is Professor of Piano at Cedarville University in Ohio, um, and he is, you can read all about his many accomplishments in his formal bio, but he is uh, also the proprietor of Improv Planet, which is an online school of uh, classical um, improvisation, for mainly for keyboardists, although also for others. Um, he's the author of a wonderful book, uh, The Pianist's Guide to Historical Improvisation, published by Oxford University Press. And also, uh, I'm awaiting his next book, which is Improvising Fugue, uh, due to come out from Oxford Press uh, this year. And yeah, I, I just on a personal note, I first became aware of, of John Mortensen's work when I was teaching piano lessons to kids uh, in Seattle. And I was delighted to come across his YouTube videos on technique, uh, which I still recommend to people uh, for piano technique and, and even keyboard technique more generally. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very delighted to have him here in person to speak to us about uh, improvisation. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Mortensen. Thank you. I'll come over here and say hello to the people online. Hi, everybody. I recognize some names there that I people I've interacted with before. It's lovely to have you join us. I am going to be hanging out at the harpsichord, so I won't we can be... move the camera around. Okay, if, if you yeah. want to get up and move it, that would be great. So I'm, I'm going to re relocate here. Uh, I've called this, what did I call this? How to fake anything on stage. And immediately someone on Facebook clutched their pearls and took great offense to <laughs> such casual nomenclature. Um, but actually I'm quite serious about doing things this way. Uh, by fake, of course, I mean prepare, uh, play without fully rehearsing and preparing an established composition. That's all it means. Um, and, and what I'd like to talk about today is sort of the reverse engineering approach that has led me to where we are right now. Um, I'm not really that much of a scholar. I'm sort of a fraud um, as a scholar, despite some publications with Oxford. And I'm, I'm really just more of a tinkerer or a meddler. And how I got into this was I, I was listening to a lot of jazz and studying jazz, and more and more was finding ways that that same kind of thinking could be brought to classical music. And um, I was trying to discover, you know, how did Beethoven improvise? How did Mozart and Bach, how did they improvise? And I was wondering how much of jazz thinking really was going on in the same way. So the, the ideal that I really had was Keith Jarrett. I love this pianist, Keith Jarrett, who's now done performing due to medical issues, but has a long discography. And what Jarrett started to do in the 70s, he would just walk out into a big concert hall, zero preparation. And he would just sit there, and then he'd improvise the entire concert from nothing. And I thought, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. What? That's an adventure. That's like walk to the edge of the cliff and just jump and see if you can fly. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I can't do that. That's terrifying. I'm trained in practicing, you know, teaching little fingers to play and rehearsing and practicing Chopin etudes and stuff. So that's really where it started. I wanted something I could bring to the stage. I didn't want to learn about footnotes and I didn't want to publish in musicological journals, and I didn't want to join Early Music America and the Historic Keyboard Society of North America and all that stuff. I just wanted to play. All that other stuff happened along the way. So what I'd like to talk about is the thought process, the sort of reverse engineering of, of how we get there. So um, anyway, this idea of reverse engineering, uh, the, the first thing I realized was, if we could do the next slide, please. Uh, sorry, I'm going to make you earn your living. Yeah. The first thing one realizes when okay, I I'll just be able to do it if that's if that's all it takes. Yeah. I am of average intelligence, and I can do that. I, mean, so I can I can sit up here and click it. Whichever, whatever. I'll just see. Okay. All right. Cool. So um, to learn to improvise, you have to have a vocabulary of various things. First of all, you have to have a harmonic vocabulary. And the troubling, terrifying, awful news is that you can play all the scores you want to 
for years and years. You can play the entire World Timbre Clavier or whatever you want to do, and you will not absorb that harmonic vocabulary. You do not learn to speak the language of music by realizing scores, no matter how faithfully, no matter what great urtext it is, no matter what great ornaments or whatever you put on it. You will not then turn around and speak that language as though it is yours um, from reciting. Uh, you, you have to participate in the construction of music. You can't just recite music that's been constructed for you. You have to participate in it. And that was, that was tough news for me because I had spent so much time learning all this. You know, I had the same education as a lot of you guys, bachelor's, master's, doctorate, all in piano performance. So all that great literature that I love. And I read a quote from Leon Fleischer, and, and he said, you know, this guy, Fleischer, what did he not play in the piano literature? All the Beethoven sonatas, everything Chopin wrote, everything Schubert wrote, everything Brahms wrote. And he said, I can't improvise three notes. And he said, it's heartbreaking for me. And I thought, that's terrible. I have to think about this, because uh, this will have repercussions. Uh, so... Uh, that got me thinking, what, you know, what do you do? And I started looking in history, what did they do to participate in the construction of music so that they could just do this? And if we could have the next slide, please. Are you Dr. Stiles, by the way? Yes. You are? Okay. The famous <laughs> Dr. Stiles. Okay. So here are some of the basics of 18th century music that, are, that allow one to absorb this vocabulary. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and, and these are things I found in the Italian tradition, the Italian conservatory tradition. Uh, and, and the reason the Italian tradition is so important is because, uh, first of all, they were the first ones to organize into schools. Uh, everyone else was on a kind of mentor, um, uh, you know, just individual instruction, um, apprenticeship method. But the Italians were the first to organize into schools. And their schools were called conservatories because they were orphanages conserving orphans from destitution. That's what conservatory means. Y'all are in a conservatory. That's what the word means. Save you from destitution. So I hope it works for, you, for everybody's sake. I hope you are rescued from destitution. So they took these little boys in at an early age, maybe six or eight years old, and they had ten years to make them employable as uh, church or theater musicians. And it, at that time, of course, you had to compose, you had to play, you had to conduct, you had to read from continual, you had to do everything. Okay? So you have 10 years, and, and um, these are not hobbyists who are going to be stockbrokers and just do music for fun. These, it's either you're going to make them good or they're going to die. So they figured out the most practical method. Unlike the Germans and French, who are always philosophizing about everything. Italians don't philosophize. They just get to work. So the first thing they taught was, um, in, in most, most of their systems, the first thing they would teach is rule of the octave. And uh, let's go ahead, Dr. Stiles, please, one, one slide. This is from Francesco Durante's um, treatise. Most of the treatises are called regole, just rules. And, and all rule of the octave is, it's a bass scale, ascending, descending, major, minor. And each note of the scale takes a certain set of upper voice intervals, or just a chord. And this is the most basic default harmonic language that will get you through almost anything, okay? And it sounds like this. That's major, here's minor. If that sounds like the most ordinary, unremarkable, daily, normal music you've ever heard, that's because it is. It's meant to be. So if I take, I did this one time in Lithuania. Um, I took the, ba uh, the, the Lithuanian national anthem, which I now can't remember, except I know it was in A major. So let's just say it goes D, D, D. just make up something. And if you put that in the bass, and then you just give every note of that rule of the octave, uh, 
uh, I want to go to six. See, it just will sound like normal music, and all I'm doing is adding rule of the octave to that in the bass. So, um, this is what I, I call this the default small talk of music. If you don't know what else to say, and you use rule of the octave, it will sound correct. So if I don't know what to say, good morning, it's lovely to be in Bloomington. It was a rainy drive. Everybody loves music. What instrument do you play? Hmm, blah, blah, blah. See, this will be nice, polite language, and it will function to show you that I'm sane and safe and that everything's fine in class today. And rule of the octave is the same thing. It will just work under almost any circumstance. And in fact, I was in Lithuania, and went to a, a, a string department recital at the, at the academy, and someone was playing Sarasate, uh, one of the virtuoso works of Sarasate. And I'm in the back row, and I just start laughing, and I realize the entire accompaniment to this is straight rule of the octave right off the shelf. Like, Sarasate is not even gonna try. He's just gonna hand this. So, rule of the octave is the first vocabulary. It's like a first pass at getting a fully functional vocabulary. And even without anything else, you can actually make pretty cool preludes out of Rule of the Octave. So let's say, let's just go down uh, in G minor. And let's say I have to create some sort of keyboard prelude on this. So what I would do... Sound, I could do that in a recital and I could get away with it here at Indiana University. If I walked in and said, mm, this is from the uh, Livre de Clavecin number 47 of some, you know, Giacomo Spumoni or whatever, make up something, I could fool your faculty. Absolutely, I could. I, I, I desire the opportunity to do this. Um, so, but you hear how normal and correct, and, and, and so all that was is. Um, going down the last measure there, and then for every chord, just some kind of figuration, okay? Or if you want to, scales will be fine. And then maybe some dramatic trill. Or instead of that, some suspensions. Sounds very, very correct. So, rule of the octave will get you through the day, even if that's the only thing you ever, ever learn. Uh, and I do want to pause and ask, what does everybody play? Could you, could you all just tell me what you play? Everybody, what do you play? Harpy. Sorry. Harpy. 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 Excellent. What do you play? <laughs> okay, okay, keyboard people. What, what, every... Okay, so we'll, we'll have to talk about this. Um, what do you play? Violin. Excellent. Bassoon. Okay. Brooklyn. Oh, Sandy. Uh, harpsichord, organ, voice. Okay, organ. and what point? Okay, and I know about him. So uh, I'll say a little bit about melody instruments a little, little bit later because this is applicable, and we do actually have people who are out there working on this stuff. For uh, I know a lot of guitarists. There, there's a cellist. I think he may even be watching today. If he is, hi John. Um, who, who are thinking of how this is applicable to? non-chord instruments. So anyway, that's rule of the octave. What's next? If 